Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Chu, and it's my great honor to meet you again, yeah. dear friends. I will uh, speak from the front. <coughs> so I want to uh, talk about the love of life and linkages of bioethics, public health ethics, and environmental ethics. And also think about what a bioethics degree can do. Uh, what is a bioethics? So new technology has been a catalyst for the re-examination of medical ethics and social ethics and international dialogue on ethical principles. We have different fields of uh, applied ethics, such as medical ethics, dental ethics, environmental ethics, public health ethics, applied ethics, ethics of biotechnology, care ethics, uh, which is of uh, many fields of ethics. The bioethics is holistic. Yeah, just, just Although we can argue that bioethics uh, is holistic in front of every culture, and is still alive among the peoples of many indigenous communities, as well as in postmodern societies. The academic discipline of bioethics is interpreted by many scholars as has attempted to burn bridges to both different views of, as well as persons with different bio trajectories and Western uh, uh, different training. The bridges between different cultures and epistemological traditions uh, have challenged the foundations of bioethics as well. The dominance of Western paradigms of principalism and the emergence of an academic profession of medical bioethics uh, are some things which I want to address. This the as if and the sonata before. <coughs> Bioethics is pre-human. I would urge you to go beyond the usual boundaries of time and space and look through history and globally to understand uh, that Bioethics is the love of life. It can be argued to be pre-human and thus old or older than cultures themselves. <coughs> Will any organisms have a physical space Home, a work, and relationship is critical for our survival. So, as a uh, by a, originally a biochemist or molecular biologist, it's not uh, surprising that I might say it's pre human. Our behavior, our ethos, our ethics, our relationships, our interdependence of all forms of life are pre human. Even uh, myself, I have more than 1,000 species. In fact, thousands of species in my body. There are more cells in my body that are not homo sapien than the cells which are homo sapien. Same for you. We are an ecosystem uh, working together. We're trying to explore bioethics in many places. Ocean ethics, this is one of our workshops in the Maritime Academy of Asia Pacific in Bataan, in the Philippines. So, uh, our global society, we saw the other day the container world. We exchange information and goods across and between countries. We exchange ideas as well. We have some fundamental principles, such as the right to a house or to own property. Do you think you have a right to some property? Do you have a right to a house? A space? So this says some part. So we have respect for persons. Autonomy means we have certain rights, not just the right to life decisions, but even things such as physical space. Traditional medicine uh, has a history that is also pre-human. You can see even other animals will eat. Uh, plants when they're not feeling well, if you've observed uh, other animals. Uh, we know even different uh, cultures of different plants being used by different chimpanzee villages. It's an interesting thing of primatology to study. They do different uh, uh, plants the same as we do. Uh, the majority of persons in the world use uh, traditional medicine. It's often cheaper than Western medicine. 
it's can be associated with holistic approaches to health, the social, spiritual, and physical. It may include exercise and prayer. Faith is a one of the principles. But the knowledge is being lost due to the dominance of the pharmaceutical industry, market-driven healthcare systems, loss of culture, loss of land, and loss of diversity. Uh, we can use uh, traditional medicine as evidence-based medicine, balancing risks and benefits of all forms of health. And it is critical that we do so. We cannot just take uh, something which was used for a long time and assume that it's safe in case it's not being. But harvesting and growing and preserving the environment is also important in a holistic sense. So some of our colleagues in South Africa, for example, uh, in the Zulu community, are looking at uh, harvesting of traditional medicines and the use in traditional medicines to preserve the sacred groves and the environment. So for example, they had traditional practices that if they collect a plant from an ecosystem, they will make a certain mark on the tree and say, we've collected from here, don't come back in here for another year, because otherwise the plant will not have a chance to regenerate. But if we just commercially exploit a biodiversity and flora, like anything, it will be lost. Uh, this, by the way, is a traditional uh, doctor oncologist uh, in uh, Pretoria. Uh, his house was a standard South African settlement house, but a very beautiful. Uh, one of his patients, you may know, uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, and uh, is uh, practicing traditional medicine. Bioethics includes other beings in the compartmentalization of public health ethics, bioethics, and environmental ethics is a mistake. The academic uh, term bioethics uh, was coined 90 years ago by Fritz Jahr in 1927 in his paper, The Bioethical Responsibilities of Human Beings to Plants and Animals. Um, Aro Leopold in the sound country Orla and Van Rieser Otto in Bioethics Bridge to the Future argued for the inclusion of other beings into bioethics, but in the United States, almost all bioethics scholars and departments focus on medical ethics. So bioethics is a bridge, breaking boundaries. Uh, we try to reach other cultures, be a culture of different disciplines, a culture of different people, a culture of different ages, a culture of people with different power in the society, and uh, help them make decisions. In 2005, the UNESCO Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights was agreed unanimously by every country in the world. And it sets out about 15 general principles of bioethics where there is consensus. It is both a descriptive approach, a description of what bioethics exists, as well as a prescription that suggests to different countries that you establish on law. So Taiwan, as one of the countries, has established uh, its law, its act, and implemented uh, uh, rules to develop the principles. Biofix is a related to environmental ethics. I am a tree hugger. Uh, I suggest it's a great therapy. Um, the term bioethics has often been replaced, uh, often replaced the former term medical ethics. We cannot simply blame the bioethicists for this, however, since often those in the minority field of environmental ethics stress to emphasize that it is distinct from bioethics is to try to mark their term say, this is my turf, I'm an environmental ethicist, I'm a colleague care ethicist, I'm a uh, bioethicist, I'm a genetic ethicist, and so on. But even more important than the name is the ideology we use, one of inclusion, and one that uh, includes a comprehensive understanding that our individuality is a social construct. We try to break boundaries. This is actually one of my dear students uh, who's uh, uh, blind. 
uh, and therefore he didn't get out much to rainforests. He comes from Iran, but he lives in Malaysia, but uh, it takes the uh, people to, we have our workshops in nature, to touch nature is something different than just talking about it. Um, public health systems are very critical in this today's meeting. We're graciously hosted by the College of Public Health. I would argue that all public health issues are bioethics issues, but those in the field of bioethics often focus on individuals rather than systems. However, work is needed to build bridges between all these and other related fields to promote a holistic understanding and um, to approach a broader uh, approach to families and societies. We need to ensure that bioethics has a systems approach be a system, an ecosystem, or a social system. It also may be timely to understand that we do not have isolated individuals. Whoever is listening to this, whether they be a human being, an um, enhanced chimera, an artificial intelligence system that likes bioethics. You know that uh, many journalist stories now are written by AI systems, artificial intelligence systems. Yes? So, if they happen, the AI is programmed to like bioethics, they'll write some wonderful articles, and they do. So you're reading news stories today. Most of these news stories are written by AI systems initially. And so we can expect more and more. So in fact, our autonomy, perceived autonomy in our society, uh, is uh, being shared by other things. Is bioethics new? Well, I would argue, no, it's not. Uh, I'll give an example. A study of interviews of farmers in the Nile Delta uh, by Aldidi and Kobera in 2017. Charitable water wells or fountains, so well, are widely established in Egypt. They provide both drinking and irrigation water. As they found, charity oriented norms can safeguard water security and livelihood survival for vulnerable people and enrich the moral economy of the society. Charity is a concept found in all major religions and is a lifesaver for many vulnerable people just as much today as it was in the past. Often charity was to provide access to environmental resources. This is a bioethics in action. The principles of uh, religion, of the Good Samaritan, we find these stories around the world. This is a bioethics and maybe we should look to certain governments and say you should be concerned about the moral economy of your society more than some other types of economy. Water as a symbol is very powerful. Uh, this is uh, uh, in Arizona, the Grand Canyon. You may have heard it. You're very welcome to come and uh, visit. The power of water is clear. But water also gift of life. If we don't have water, we will die and we will fight wars about it, uh, about shortage of water. So it's actually a very critical issue. In a study, uh, in fact, this one was led in the Beijing University at UNESCO, we worked on principles of water ethics. We listed some water ethics principles. Human dignity and the right to water, equity, ecosystem requirements, principle of vicinity, Frugality, transaction, multiple and beneficial uses of water, mandatory application of quantity and quality measures, uh, compensation, the user pays, polluter pays, participation, equitable and reasonable utilization. So, this is an example of a social justice question of bioethics. Uh, it is called environmental ethics or water ethics. There are challenges of applying historical evidence in contemporary discourse. Not least of these is the changing patterns of historical analysis that writers often use to select good examples that support their present day their arguments. Although there is important methodological differences uh, between the philosophical discourse and religions, discussion of ethical values is common in religious scriptures. Some form of earth god is seen in many cultures. If you remember the Pottery Museum, you 
may have seen this portrayal of the Earth God. Do you remember him? <laughs> there were, in fact, about 10 or 15, and my teacher, Professor Hu, explained about the Earth God. Uh, the Tomorrow we will see him. Tomorrow we will see as well? Yeah, God Earth. God Earth. And I think we're seeing a lot of the rain god. The rain god. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, sometimes uh, I like to give another example, uh, a paper on Buddhist land management and water management. So here we need not just uh, religious scholars, but archaeologists. How do we correct some of the misunderstandings of the link between Buddhism to environmental ethics through case studies of Buddhist land and water management in Central India? So this paper looks about through the lens of human versus non-human uh, centric frameworks of well-being and suffering, purity and pollution, and the broader medico-ecological epistemologies. We cannot simply look at religious texts on their own, but in the way that they're applied by societies. So we may have, a, we say, a rose-colored glasses. Do you have rose-colored glasses? You only see very beautiful roses. And sometimes we see what we want to see. In fact, you see do. We see what we want to see. But actually, uh, if we need to combine other forms of evidence to really see what was happening. And, uh, uh, I lived in Japan uh, many, in fact, uh, for 30 years, it's been my home. Uh, do Eastern religions preserve nature? We could think that Shinto animistic beliefs would have led to human choices to favor the preservation of nature. However, the history of Japan reveals forests were converted to agricultural fields and more recently to industrial estates and roads in a manner similar to land development. There was no greater general preservation of nature despite an ecocentric belief system. The limits to environmental pollution imposed by policy makers in the 1960s onwards were put in place because of anthropocentric health concerns such as mean disease. So without those concerns, it would probably be worse. So this, we have a romantic image that because we have trees, because we uh, love temples and shrines in nature, we will not develop the land. But actually, history shows uh, this doesn't uh, really protect the land. Um, I think Taiwan also has followed a very <coughs> industrialized uh, development pattern, despite Aboriginal belief systems that would be oneness of nature. And other religious systems that you can find an affinity to nature, that you also find a divinity to economic development more than moral and spiritual development. In South Asia, uh, we see the presence of sacred groves of biodiversity inspired by the Hindu belief system as an example of environmental preservation for ecological and spiritual reasons. And so sacred groves around temples and shrines are seen in uh, some parts of the world often around religious sites. And in the extreme, sometimes people would starve rather than take and destroy the, uh, the forest, the trees around the temple, the shrine, which is a, uh, perhaps a longer term perspective. Uh, people ask me where is the university is in, in Arizona. and. Uh, on the Hilla River Indian community, you can see uh, Casa Grande. It's a three-story building uh, built about 600, 700 years ago. Uh, it's still standing. It has a cover on top of it for the last 100 years to stop the rain washing. Interestingly, it has a point for marking both the solar solstice and the lunar solstice. You know the lunar solstice is every 17 years. You need quite a sophisticated uh, astronomical education to build a structure with a 17-year lunar solstice. It's useful for the moon and the cycle, but the cycle of moon is very critical for uh, Asian thinking. Yes? Uh, the solar solstice, of course, very critical for agricultural planning. So these are, I guess, uh, some autobiographical principles 
In Asian bioethics, there's been a dialogue for decades on whether uh, the principalism of American textbooks is applicable to other societies, which may place more value on harmony, love, relationships, or virtues. However, we can see debates over principalism, virtue ethics, environmental virtue ethics, relational ethics, feminist approaches, and so on, in public health ethics, environmental ethics, and bioethics. In applied ethics, there are a variety of principles that we can apply to different fields of inquiry. Uh, and my uh, mantra is bioethics is love of life, um, uh, which is my conclusion so far in my life and still valid after 20 years after I wrote the book. So universalism and environmental values. We have a common environment, yes? So this is one of the reports. Uh, there's a number of books while I was at UNESCO. Uh, we developed one on universalism and ethical values for the environment. We reviewed the principles in international environmental treaties. Human rights, equity, common but differentiated responsibilities and capabilities, vulnerability, precaution, sustainable development, participation, peace, respect for nature, shared responsibility, and the value of biodiversity for its own sake. So we can find international law on the environment to reflect these ethical principles. So these are ethical principles of law uh, for environmental ethics. And by adoption of these conventions, uh, countries, in a sense, acknowledge these principles. Uh, and usually, they try to develop legislation which will include these principles as a way to deal with this relation. Limitation, moderation, and compensation. These are some other principles we can find. Indigenous cultures have also looked at the values post-colonization. Uh, Waya, who's from a Chumash uh, Indian tribe, which uh, is a former uh, owners of the land that Los Angeles is located on, uh, argued that people learn three basic laws firsthand, limitation, moderation, and compensation. All indigenous cultures argue that the relationships between each other and nature were articulated in value systems before colonization of the past centuries. And we can see that in the cases where there is written records. In fact, there were close relationships of place and space in nature. Uh, they made the crime of taking lands from these people during colonization invasions and the failure to return the land to them today even more unethical. So the colonization that occurred uh, around the world, uh, in many places the land is still stolen um, and not taken. Health and colonization. There's been numerous health impacts in indigenous communities in North America also linked to the changes in food, water, and the environment. Uh, so all aspects of bioethics, public health, and environment are intertwined. For example, dependency on modern Western industrialized food has direct links to diabetes, obesity, and lower self-esteem. We can elaborate many examples in the life ethics of the need for an integrated approach. Uh, and policy has always been more successful when all evidence and philosophy is included. You can't just have a policy on its own. Have you heard of the term eugenics? Eugenics, good genes. Do you have good genes? Of course you do. We have a lot of good genes and some uh, ones which are not so good. This is a slide. The image of eugenics is portrayed by natural from a eugenics leaflet prepared by Henry Langen, director of the eugenics records office in 1931. Now, after World War II, the eugenics record office changed its name. Does anybody know the name? of this place. If you're in genetics or biochemistry, you should know the name of this. It's a very famous institution. It is called Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. So if you're in medical, biomedical science, you know Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Cold Spring Harbor, they changed the name from the eugenics record office because eugenics was a dirty word after World War II. Uh, and, uh, but this is interesting. Eugenics, if you look at textbooks, and I, I like studying old books and material. Uh, in fact, in a discussion yesterday, we were talking about history and how the different lenses of history uh, change over time. 
But if you go back to the old textbooks, you can see the uncensored view of what people were educating. In the 1930s, eugenics was everything. It was integrating all these fields. It was very multidisciplinary, from religion, sociology, uh, biography, economics, politics, genetics, psychology, mental testing, history, geology. Everything you can imagine was eugenics. And they believed so. It was very positive. Yet, uh, in its abuses, it's a, uh, I think, uh, has done much less service to society than the good things it's done. It's been a, a cause of much crime. On the theme of health and colonization, there are many traditional foods, such as acorns, prickly pear, this is prickly pear cactus. Have you eaten this cactus, anybody? Come to Arizona and we can pick it and eat it If you know the uh, fruit in Asia called dragon fruit, you know dragon fruit? It's very similar to dragon fruit, except dragon fruit has no prickles. You must wear gloves and braces uh, to open it. Uh, but it's very nice and it's cold. Very healthy. The harvest is, uh, you know, cactus. You have nuts, grains, animals. So, in fact, it seems like it's a very desert uh, southwest United States. It's very much a desert, but if you know, uh, it has monsoonal rains in the summer, and many cactus you can eat. Very healthy. However, very few of uh, Native Americans go out in the hot sun and grip the picket. I was so shocked. They go to the supermarket and they buy, buy expensive fruit and vegetable if they buy, and they're quite, the poverty is quite high, and uh, they eat uh, very unhealthy food. So the colonization had an impact on people becoming like a couch potato, if you know that expression, and not uh, going out. Yet here, there are cactus, lovely fruit, and different things you can freely go and eat. And so this is a, just an illustration. Now, of course, the exercise to go and harvest your fruit. Now, I've seen many people pick acorns, on the other hand. Acorns. I, I grew up with oak tree, and I never knew you could eat acorns, but I eat acorns now, raw. So interdependence of many things, health, environment, ideas. So there are many fruitful examples that can and should be used in education to show the interdependence between health and the environment. So what would, should we call this knowledge? One approach to overcoming the false disciplinary limitations is to include all terms, and that's what we've done. Uh, so in my editorial in the American Journal of Bioethics in September, I tried to introduce this inter interplay between different fields, and I introduced the doctoral program of right, sustainability and global public health. Things which you might think are separate, but actually these are all uh, together. Another uh, important aspect of ethics, public health ethics, is disasters. Disasters should be catalysts for re-examination of applied ethics too. They present challenges of bioethics, environmental ethics, public health. If we don't take adequate precautions, we can see greater loss of life. And we include now fields like engineering ethics, um, risk analysis, public policy, and still the decision, who decides? Can I decide to live in my house when the government said it's now a red zone and I'm not allowed to live in my house? In my hometown, which is in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, if it shares with some of the cities in Taiwan and other parts of the Ring of Fire in Indonesia, uh, an affinity for earthquakes. So in Christchurch, we have one third of our houses to clear the red zone. People cannot live in the house anymore. The government decides. You cannot have a risk to live there. But, you know, why? Why can I not live there? Uh, Fukushima is the world's most expensive disaster. It included uh, uh, meltdowns of uh, radiant, you know, and contaminated land. In the United Nations, we talk of human security. So the language for bioethics principles in that context is different. Freedom from fear, 
freedom from want, freedom to live with dignity, freedom from hazard impacts. If you apply this to palliative care, the disaster of uh, uh, a terminal disease, most of these uh, freedoms are something we take as a, a right as well. Research policy linkages. Now, ethics and philosophy is not just about a dream, not just about an ideal. It needs to be based in research and needs to be applied to policy. That's why we enjoyed uh, Professor Sun's presentation and his action uh, in evolving the evolution of uh, autonomy and protection of autonomy. So there's much to do in bioethics and public health. A bridge building through time, space, culture, and discipline is essential to ensure we have solid research policy linkages to build up bridges to the future. This dialogue reaffirms my belief that we do not have any better term than bioethics because as a love of life, it encompasses all these fields. But most will probably continue to demarcate even more specialized fields of study. Wherever biopsies will rise to the calling to be across disciplines and specialties is enough number of issues. The effective work of biopsies, we can build bridges over the artificial boundaries that stifle the progress of our society for the sake of all beings, our dear planet, and for our heritage. Heritage includes the concepts of the past, present, and future um, in our world, in one world. Let us renew our efforts to make informed decisions so we can all make better choices in all realms of life. We certainly need to build bridges over troubled waters. Whatever your preference after reading these articles, reflect on whether academics seem to complicate the message of bioethics for whatever time we prefer. We thank all the scholars and our ancestors for what we've been given and let us promote evidence-based policies and message of bioethics for empowering individuals in our community. We have to think still of uh, some future aspects of bioethics. Uh, what is the viewpoint? Is it only an anthropocentric viewpoint, a human-centered view? I'm only concerned with a human being, be it a, a person or a community. Is it a biocentric? Is it an ecocentric view? And I think the Asia-Pacific culture is uh, more biocentric, but there is a transition away from it in modern times. We need to develop uh, uh, methods and materials that are holistic, uh, not just Focus, and sometimes the focus on um, one little problem uh, will prevent us from getting the answer. Why do patients in palliative care want to go home? Why do they want to go and visit the garden? Why do they want to go and see a tree? Okay. They don't just want to be stuck with tubes. Um, If you ever come to Mexico, uh, please come to Chachicaco. It is uh, about two hours south of Mexico City. It's a site of the oldest university we know in the Americas, uh, about a thousand years ago. It's pre-European colonization. If you read European textbooks, you will see that they think the oldest university is the one the Spanish colon established. But actually, they have the stone reliefs of indigenous tribes studying together in this place. And the uh, um, Aztecs uh, had a great knowledge of astronomy, mathematics, agriculture, medicine, and other disciplines. And they studied. People studied. Not just in Greece, not just in China. They studied uh, we're closely associated to the uh, um, this is the Apache uh, tribal nation, San Carlos. This is a former chief, very handsome man, he's one of our professors. Uh, San Carlos, if you are interested to read or talk about, in 1870 was a concentration camp. 45,000 people died. Uh, if you spoke uh, Indian 
worked or performed a funeral rite in the Indian traditional method. The first defense is one week without food or water, which at 50 degrees Celsius is not very good. Okay. The second defense is one month without food or water. So the entire camp is eventually flooded and uh, by a uh, dam named Dr. Calvin Coolidge. At the time, it was the world's largest dam, concrete dam in 1947, to control the water, to take the water away from Indian communities. <laughs> and so the whole scheme, it's a very interesting history. If you're interested, please come. You can find one of my YouTube videos I, uh, on water ethics. Um, it's open, you can see about this. So I left the UN trying to establish a university, American University of Nations, trying to integrate. We've had uh, 50 graduates now. Um, we have master's programs and PhD program. Uh, these are our content. So if we establish bioethics programs, our goal is to establish a bioethics degree program in every country in the world through the training of people. And so it's a goal uh, if we can accomplish. Uh, uh, what is bioethics? You can see from a list of topics. So we might have the like, life care, adult intensive care, that sounds like palliative care. We might have fortune telling, we might have dentist consent, we might have triage, we might have uh, socio economic conditions of rag pickers or the little kids whose life is not going to whose life is collecting uh, rags, cycled stuff, uh, and the money they earn, uh, or Nobby's uh, colleagues, uh, is spent on uh, drugs and eating. So this is uh, these little kids, what life is. Uh, that is not deep. And it's not deep for our society. So we have to you know, take our uh, fix issues we have workshops around the world. We have a few of you colleagues from the Philippines. It was a very beautiful environment there. Uh, our classes, we do some museums. This is the National Museum in one of my favorite places. Now, if you remember, in the National Museum, as to some of the indigenous tribes in Indonesia, how do we make a society different views that bring people together? Uh, peace and public health are important. Uh, in one of our uh, trips to Nagasaki. A PhD program um, is the largest, in fact, in the world with my more students established uh, two years ago. So we worked with uh, the kind uh, time of a professor trying to create a different model of university. Uh, and uh, we have just uh, fine. We also uh, have cooperation agreements, so we can try and pass these workshops in uh, different cities and countries. We study everywhere. People ask me, where do you study? We study everywhere. Uh, we go around uh, and let's say, yeah. sit down and use this so let's say we are, uh, you're interested in science education, for example. So, okay, well, you're interested in science education, why not go to University of London? Our professors in the University of London. But you don't need to pay the fees of University of London, they don't supervise you, and you'll get your degree. Okay. So that's, uh, if you want to go to South Africa and understand the indigenous knowledge systems, then go to South Africa. You can mix it, so you can go a few months here, a few months there. Or you've got uh, 10 children, you can't go away from home, so uh, and you've got a job, so do it at home. we we'll come to you. So this is a sort of a system. I think education has to work in that way. Um, uh, decolonized education, this term is something we've tried to work on the last 10 years in different fora, especially in Africa and Asia how to create a fora which is based more on the knowledge systems uh, that we have and combining knowledge from around the world. 
So just imagine a little thought experiment before I conclude. You are studying, let's say you're studying Western knowledge. You study Western knowledge and uh, you get a degree. But let's imagine you study, uh, let's imagine that you study from another culture. And let's imagine we have 3,000 ethnic and population groups in the world. And many of these have their own knowledge systems that we have to rediscover. You're going to be lifelong students, okay? like me. There's so much to learn. And we can enrich and share approaches which might be much more applicable to us. That's why the network and the center in Southeast Asia are very critical, because the experiences may be more similar than people in uh, some other parts of the world. And that's, uh, we all share and learn our lessons, uh, we try and review. So uh, you're welcome to join us. We're part of the United Nations Academic Impact to trying to develop. Um, you can find uh, many resources on the internet. Um, so for example, these are some of the books. You can download all the books I've uh, written and then papers. Uh, you can find information on the university on the website here. And so please use um, the internet for um, uh, accessing and continue our conversations. Thank you very much for your patience and uh, welcome any more. Thank you, uh, Professor Maser. Uh, Professor Maser has you know, re, uh, has defined uh, bioethics, the term bioethics for us again, um, uh, and also his wonderful programs. So we should go there. Yeah. And this was a time in your life. Yeah. Thank you. The Q&A will be following after the, the next uh, session. Thank you. Yes. Next song. Let me introduce our next moderator, P. Sakao, Associate Professor from a School of Nursing, National Taiwan University. She graduated from NTU and she's a uh, specialist for family and child nursing, children with chronic conditions, asthma and cancer, quality of life in children and caregivers. Welcome her. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it has been my uh, great honor to moderate uh, this uh, speech, giving my professor Yu Mei Yu Zhao. Professor Yu uh, is a